สวัสดีค่ะ Good morning everybody it is 20 minutes to eight at my time and today I'm going to read a story which I learned from ESL reading class about how many years ago four five years ago โอเคก็นะคะบนมีเรื่องที่สนุกสนุกมาอ่านนะคะวันนี้เป็นเป็นเรื่องที่โบสเคยเรียนในห้องเรียน ESL ESL ก็คือสำหรับทุกคนที่พูดภาษาอังกฤษเป็นภาษาที่สองนะคะคุณครูที่สอนเป็นคุณครูอาสาสอนโดยที่ไม่ได้ตังนะคะสอนฟรีสนุกสนานนะคะอ่ะเรื่องราวก็มีอยู่ว่าอย่างนี้นะคะ The next l a t e she was once of those pretty and charming girls born as if by an error of fate into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no means of becoming known, understood, loved, or waited by a man of wealth and distinction. And so she let herself be married to a minor official at the Ministry of Education. She dressed poorly because she had never been able to afford anything better, but she was as unhappy as if she had once been wealthy. Women don't belong to caste or class; their beauty, grace. And natural charm take the place of birth and family. Natural delicacy, instinctive elegance, and a quick wit, wit determine their place in society, and make the daughters of commoners the equals of the very finest ladies. She suffered endlessly, feeling she was. Entitled to all the delicacy and luxuries of life, she suffered because of the poorness of her house. As she looked at the dirty walls, the worn-out chairs, and the ugly curtains, all these things that another woman of her class would not even have noticed, tormented her and made her. Resentful, the sense of the little burdened girl who did her housework filled her with terrible regrets and hopeless fantasies. She dreamed of silent antique chamber, uh, antique chamber hung with oriental tape stories, lit from above by torch, uh, torches in bronze holders. While two tall footmen in the lane, breeches napped in huge armchairs, sleeping from the stove's oppressive warmth, she dreamed of best living rooms furnished in rare old silks, elegant furniture. Ah, uh, sorry, elegant furniture loaded with priceless ornaments, and inviting small rooms. Her room made for afternoon chats with close friends, famous sauce after men who are women envy and desire. When she sat down to dinner at a round table covered with a three-day-old cloth opposite her husband, who, lifting the lids of the soup, shouted excitedly, "Ah, beef stewed!" What could be better? She dreamed of fine dinners, of shining silverware, of tapestries, which peopled the wall. Oh no, sorry, which peopled the walls with figures from another time and string birds in fairy forests. She dreamed of delicious dishes served on wonderful plates, of whisper galanteries. Ah.、Uh, Gallant trees listened to with an inscrutable 
inscrutable smiles as one ate the pink flesh of a trout or the wings of a cow. Oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know this word. She had no dresses, no jewels, nothing, and these were the only things she loved. She felt she was missed for them alone. She wanted so much to charm, to be envy, to be desired and sought after. She had a rich friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, whom she no longer wanted to visit because she suffered so much when she came home. For whole days afterwards, she would weep with sorrow, regret, despair, and misery. One evening, her husband came home with an air of triumph, holding a large envelope in his hand. Look, he said, here's something for you. She tore open the paper and drew out a card on which was printed the words, The Minister of Education and M. George Rampano request the precious of M and Ma'am, uh, Mr. and Madam, okay, Mr. and Madam Lucille's company at the minister, uh, ministry on the evenings of Monday, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she drew the invitation on the table resentfully and muttered, What do you want me to do with that? But, my dear, I thought, you would be pleased. You never go out, and it will be such a lovely occasion. I had awful trouble getting it. Everyone wants to go. It is very exclusive, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole ministry will be there. She stared at him angrily and said impatiently, And what do you expect me to wear if I go? He hadn't thought of that. He stammered. Why? The dress you go to the theater in, it seems very nice to me. He stopped, stunned, dis uh, distressed. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so hard. Distressed to see his, worst, uh, his wife crying. Two large tears ran slowly from the corners of her eyes towards the corners of her mouth. He stuttered. What's the matter? What's the matter? With great efforts, she, uh, she overcame her griefs and replied in a calm voice as she wiped her wet cheeks. Nothing. Only have no dress and so I can't go to this party. Give your invitation to a friend whose wife has better clothes than I do. He was distraught, uh, distraught, but try again. Let's see, Maltilda, Maltilda, Maltilda. I'm, I'm so sorry because on my paper, it's spelling with the A, but on here it's spelling with the E. Okay, let, let's call Maltilda, okay? How much would a suitable dress cost? One which you could use again on other occasions, something very simple. She thought for a moment, computing the cost and also wondering what amount he could ask for without an immediate, immediate refusal. And an alarm exclamation for the 50, uh, 50 clerk. At last, she answered hesitantly, I don't know exactly, but I think I could do it with 400 francs. He turned a little pale, 
because he had been safely checked except a mouse to buy a gun and treat himself to a hardy trip the following some oh, I'm sorry uh, he turned a little pale because he had been safely that exact amount to buy a gun and treat himself to a hunting trip the following summer in the country near that tree that tree I don't know the name of this city with a few friends who went love shooting there on Sundays however he said very well I can give you 400 francs, but try and get a really beautiful dress. The day of the party drew near, and Madame Blossel seemed sad, restless, anxious. Her dress was, uh, her dress was ready, however. One evening, her husband said to her, What's the matter? You've been adding strength these last three days. She replied, I'm upset that I have no juice and a single stone to wear. Oh, I'm so sorry, you're not add, not. I said, read this again. She replied, I'm upset that I have no juice, not a single stone to wear. I will look cheap. I will almost rather not go to the party you could wear flowers he said they are really fashionable at this time for years for year for 10 francs you could get two or three magnificent roses she was not convinced no there's nothing more he will any than looking poor in the middle of a lot of rich women how still fit you are, her husband cried. Go and see your friend, Madame uh, Forster. Forster. In, in my paper, it's spelling Forster, but in here it's for, Forster. I can't read the name. <laughs> and asked her to lend you some juice. You know her well enough for that. She uttered a cry of joy. Of course, I had not thought of that. I'm so sorry for my photos and it make my voice is not clear. But I will read until it's finished, okay? The next day, she went to her friend's house and told her of her uh, distress. Madame Foster went to her mirror's wardrobe, took out a large box brought it back, opened it, and said to Madame Louisville, Choose, my dear. First, she saw some bracelets, then a pearl necklace, then a gold weighted crosses with precious stones of exquisite craftsmanship. Exquisite, this word, I don't, I don't have idea what is that. Of exquisite craftsmanship. She tried on the jewelry in the mirror, hesitated, could not bear to part with them. To give them back, she kept asking, you have nothing else? Why? Yes, but I don't know what you like. Suddenly, she discovered in a black satin box a superb diamond necklace, and her heart began to beat with uncontrolled desire. Her hands trembled as she looked it uh, as she took it. She fastened it around her neck, over her high neck dress, and stood lost in ecstasy or ecstasy as she looked at herself. Then she asked anxiously, hesitating, would you let me this? Just this? Why? Yes, of course. She threw her arms around her friend's neck, embraced her uh, rapturous, lap, rapturously, this is the new words for me, rapturously, then fled with her treasure. 
Ten days after the party arrived, Madame Roussel was a success. She was prettier than all the other women, elegant, gorgeous, smiling, and full of joy. All the men stared at her as her name tried to be introduced, and all cabinet officials wanted to waltz with her. The minister noticed her. She danced wildly with passion, drunk on pleasures, forgetting everything in the triumph of her beauty, in the glory of her success, in a source of clouds of happiness. Made out of all this respect, all these admirations, all these awakened, ah, uh, awakened desires of that sense of triumph that is so sweet to a woman's heart. She left at about four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been dozing since midnight in a little deserted afternoon uh, at the room with three other gentlemen whose wives were having a good time. He threw over her shoulders the cloth he had brought for her to go outside in, the modest cloth of an ordinary life, whose poverty contrasted sharply with the elegance of the baldness. She felt this and wanted to run away, so she wouldn't be noticed by the other women who were wrapping themselves, uh, themselves in expensive furs. Lucy held her back. Wait a moment, you catch a cold outside. I go and find cab. But she would not listen to him and ran down the stairs. When they were finally in the street, they could not find cab and began to look for one, shouting at the cabmen they saw passing in the distance. She walked down toward the, the scene or the scene in despair, shivering with cold. At last, they found on the quay one of those all-night caps that one sees in Paris only after dark, as if they were as ashamed to show their shabbiness during the day. They were dropped off at their door in the Rue des Martyrs and Sally walked up the steps to their apartment. It was our offer for her, and he was remembering that he had to be back at his office at 10 o'clock. In front of the mirror, she took off the clothes around her shoulders, taking a final look at herself in all her glory. But suddenly she uttered a cry. She no longer had the necklace round her dick. What is the matter? asked her husband, already half undressed. She turned towards him, panic striking. I have, I have, I no longer have Madame Foster necklace. He stood up, distraught. What? How? That's impossible. They looked in the folds of her dress, in the folds of her cloak, in her pockets, everywhere, but they could not find it. Are you sure you still had it on when you left the boat? He asked. Yes, I touched it in the hall at the ministry. But if you had lost it in the street, we would have heard it fall. It would be in the cab. Yes, that's probably it. Did you take his number? No, and you? Did you notice it? No! They stared at each other, stunned. And at last, Lucy put his clothes on again. I'm going back, he said. Over the whole route, we walked. See if I can find it. He left. She remained in her ball dress all evening without a string to go to bed. Sitting on a chair with no fire, her mind blank. Her husband returned at about seven o'clock. He had found nothing. He went to the police, to the newspaper, to office. A reward. A reward. Oh, sorry. He went to the police, to the newspapers, to offer a reward.
to the cab companies everywhere the tiniest glimmer of hope led him. She waited all day in the same state of blank despair from before this frightful disaster. Lucia returned in the evening, a hollow, pale figure. He had found nothing. You must write to your friend, he said. Tell her you have broken the crabs of her nexus and that you are helping it mend it. It will give us time to look some more. She wrote as he di dictated. At the end of one week, they had lost all hope, and Lucius, who had aged five years, declared, We must consider how to repress the Jew. The next day they took the box which had held it, and went to the general whose name they found inside. He consulted his books. It was not I, madam, who saw the next leg. I must simply have supplied the case. And so they went from jeweler to jeweler looking for a necklace, uh, looking for a necklace like the other one, consulting their memories, both sick with grief and anguish. In a shop as the palace royal, royal they found a string of diamonds, which seemed to be exactly what they were looking for. It was worth 40,000 francs. They could have it for 36,000. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days. And they made an arrangement that he would take it back for 34,000 francs if the other nexus was found before the end of February. Luisa had 18,000 francs, which his father had less him. He would borrow the rest, and he did borrow, asking for a thousand francs from one man, five hundred from another, five Louis here, three Louis there. He gave notes, made ruinous agreements, dealt with uh, as Euro, as you, I don't know what this word, as euros, <laughs> with every type of money lender. He compromised the rest of his life, risked singing, say, uh, signing notes without knowing if he could ever honor them, and terrified, uh, terrified by the anguish still to come, by the black misery about to fall on him, on him, by the prospect of every physical privation and every moral torture he was about to suffer. He went to get the new necklace and laid down on the jeweler's counter, 36,000 francs. When Madame Russell took the necklace back, Madame Foster said coldly, You should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. To the relief of her friend, she did not open the case. If she had detected the substitution, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she have taken her friends for a thief? From then on, Madame Lucille knew the horrible life of the very poor, but she played her past heroic, uh, heroically. The dreadful debt must be paid. She would pay it. They dismissed their maid. They changed their lodgings. They rented a garret under the roof. The roofs. Uh, the roof. She came to know the drudgery of housework, the odious labors of the kitchen. She washed the dishes, sending her rusty nails on greasy pots and bottoms of pans. She washed the dirty linen, the chairs and the dishcloths, which she hung on, uh, which she hung to dry on a line. 
She carried the garbage down to the street every morning and carried up the water, stopping at each landing to catch her breath. And dressed like a commoner, she went to the fruit stores, the groceries, the butchers, her basket on her arm, bargaining, insulted, fighting over every miserable soul. Each month they had to pay some notes, renew others, get more time. Her husband worked every evening doing accounts for a tradesman, and often, late into the night, he sat copying a manuscript at five souls a, part, uh, a page. And I'm so sorry if I read the money currency wrong because I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> and this life let a uh, last test ten years. At the end of ten years, they had paid off everything, everything, and assure, uh, assurance. I don't know how to read it exactly. Assurance uh, rates and with. The accumulations of compound interests. Madame Lucille looked old now. She had become strong, hard and rough like all women of impoverished, uh, impoverished households, impoverished also. With her half combed, viscous awry, and reddened Hands, she talked loudly as she washed the floor with great switches of water. But sometimes, when her husband was at the office, she sat down near the window and thought of that evening at the ball so long ago, when she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How strange life is, how fickle, how tidal, uh, how little is needed for one to be ruined or saved. One Sunday, as she was walking in the champs illicit to refresh herself after the week's work, suddenly she saw a woman walking with a child. It was Madame Forster, still young, still beautiful, still charming. Madame Lucille felt emotional. Should she speak to her? Yes, of course. And how that she had paid. Oh, sorry. And now that she had paid, she would tell her all. Oh, why not? She went up to her. Good morning, Jean. The other astonished to be addressed so familiarly. Uh, familiarly. Familiarly, oh sorry, familiarly, by this common woman did not recognize her. She stammered. But, madam, I don't know. You must have made a mistake. No, I am Maltita Lucille. Her friend Arthur at crying. Oh, my poor Maltita, how have you changed? Yes. I have had some hard times since I last saw you, and many miseries, and all because of you. Me? How can that be? You remember that diamond necklace that you lent me to wear to the ministry party? Yes, well, well, I lost it. What do you mean you brought it back? I brought you back another exactly like it. And it has taken us for ten years to pay off it, uh, to pay for it. It wasn't easy for us. He had very, we have very little, but at least, uh, at last, it's, it's over. And I am very glad. Madame Foster was stunned. You said that you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine? Yes, you did notice that? They were very similar, and she smiled with proud and innocent pressure. Madame Foster deeply moved, took both her hands. Oh, my poor Maltina, 
but it was an invitation. It was worth 500 francs at most. Okay, that is a story and it is longer than on my paper and also on my paper the vocabulary is easier than here. Anyway, the story is the same, just only on my paper is kind of brief story, but here I think the story is contain more detail, okay, and I found out there are new vocabularies for me that I don't know how to pronounce them correctly. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Okay. ก็อ่านจบไปแล้วนะคะในในเว็บนะเรื่องเขาละเอียดกว่าในในอ่าที่คุณครูเขาแจกให้โบนะที่คุณครูแจกให้โบมีอยู่สามหน้าแต่ที่นี่ก็มีตั้งแปดหน้าแล้วคำศัพท์ในนี้ยากกว่าในที่โบนมีแล้วก็หลายๆคำโบนอ่านไม่ออกแล้วก็อย่างเช่นไอตัวที่เป็นอัตราเงินอะ่ะก็ไม่รู้ว่ามันคือเงินอะไรนึกไม่ออกอะ่ะไอเงินฟรังก์เนี่ยเคยเคยได้ยินน่าจะเป็นเงินฝรั่งเศสหรือเปล่าไม่รู้เงินฟรังก์ไม่แน่ใจนะเดาเอาส่วนไอเงินที่มันเป็นไอซูซิตอะไรเนี่ยไม่รู้จักอะ่ะก็ขอให้ใครที่ฝึกอ่านก็ลองดูนะคะท้าทายตัวเองแล้วสำหรับน้องเหมียวนะคะที่บนบอกไปอ่านแล้วก็ค่อยๆคิดตามนะจะได้เข้าใจเห็นไหมว่ามันยาวถ้าเกิดเราเราไม่คิดตามตั้งแต่แรกเนี่ยเราต้องมาเสียเวลาอ่านใหม่อีกเพื่อจะให้เข้าใจใช่ปะ่ะคือค่อยๆค,คิดตอนที่พี่โอทำก็คือถ้าอ่านอ่านทีละย่อหน้าไม่เข้าใจก็กลับไปอ่านอีย่อหน้าเดิมเนี่ยใหม่นะแล้วก็คิดให้เข้าใจเออย่อหน้าในเก่ามันเล่าว่าอะไรพอเราเข้าใจย่อหน้าแล้วเราก็มาเข้าใจย่อหน้าค่อยๆทีละย่อหน้าก็ได้นะจะได้มันจะได้หัดคิดคือสอนสมองให้ตัวเองหัดคิดไปเรื่อยๆนะคะงั้นไปแล้วขอบคุณที่มาฟังกันนะคะสวัสดีค่ะ